Good morning, everyone. And uh, we're going to begin again our study, continue our study on finishing up Judges uh, 14. Any questions we have regarding that? And then we will continue on Judges 15. So let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have each day to open your word together. And uh, we are thankful, Lord, for this past year, uh, this being uh, the last study in this year on this, on this examining, uh, we're not examining, understanding the lines. So we just pray, Lord, that um, you can be here to instruct us and to guide each person in their day-to-day -day walk with you. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and minds, give us wisdom and understanding, and help us to think clearly and to be able to present these truths to others. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just put up the chart from yesterday, so finishing Judges 14, just if there was any questions, I added the uh, February 12th, 2022 Odilio presentation, which is going to be that 49 days, the seven weeks from Colin's presentation, um, which I think is significant in the context of the riddle. Was there any final questions on this chapter and this chart? So you got uh, Judges 13 above there, Judges 14 on the bottom. I'm going to open up my my notes because I do have a question for you. Okay. So, as we have gone through this, mm -hmm. okay, <clears throat> when. When we were going through this, we have we have a couple of verses that are set out as being an additional subject. So Judges 14, 8, 14, 9. And after a time, he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating. And came to his father and his mother, and he gave them. And they did eat, but he told them not, he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. <clears throat> so in this situation, he's returning from his desire to enter into a covenant relationship that as a Nazarite he was not to enter into and the Nazarites were also not supposed to uh, touch any dead body yeah now what symbols do we take from this that he was turning this aside that he had he made the choice not to honor his Nazarite commitment I don't know. Do you have an idea? That's what I've been puzzling on. I mean, I mean, the problem and part of this is this is ironic. So, um, I mean, I don't know how we would look at that other than we know that in this turning aside, he ends up finding the source of his riddle. Right. And, and see, that's the thing that's difficult about this, uh, this story of Samson, of course, is that um, he's representing our human nature. He's representing the weakness of humanity, where Christ shows the strength of, of divinity over humanity. Here, Samson is controlled by his humanity, yet he's typifying Christ. And also typifying in our application, typifying uh, this message 
that this movement is involved in. So Tep, in a sense, symbolizes the movement itself, but particularly in context of this proclamation of July 18th and the 777 days. So um, we could say that, um, because where we try to place this riddle, particularly, I see it as happening after July 18th, right? So the lion the, and the honey, I mean, we have here in this chart that you see there, it's, it's before July 18th, right? Right. But, but, the, but the riddle being proposed isn't proposed prior. So we have the line in the honey, but, but the, the unraveling of the riddle, I guess, the, the riddle being proposed. So, so in a sense, you can say that Samson turns aside prior to July 18th, notices this line in the honey, right? Eats of it, shares it, but then he's going to propose the riddle after July 18th. Does that right. make sense? But, no, that's logical. Yeah, okay. And so, you know, specifically where he proposes that riddle, um, you know, I I sort of says it said it, it's going to happen with Collins and Odilio's presentations. So we have the line in the honey, we have this um, July 18th event, however you want to put that in the story of Samson, but it's Samson is representing this. Um, but that riddle is going to be proposed at the end of the seven, seven, seven days. And the idea here is that Judges 13 is focused on July 18th itself as the center. And, and here, really, this is a zoom into December 25th, 2021. Um, but this whole line is, is, of course, repeating. But the focus here has to do with this riddle that's then presented. And um, and then it's going to lead us to this understanding because of the 30, 30, 30, um, that we end up with this April 5th, 2030 being demonstrated, right? Those three months, because 30 is going to represent a month. And so it brings us from uh, the proposing of the riddle on December 25th, uh, 2022, or pardon me, um, on 20, 2021, the riddle is proposed, but then on December 25th, 2021, we have the beginning of this divorcement. So these two December 25ths are tied together. And even Colin had done this. I, I don't fully understand his logic, but he ended up pointing out this December 25th, 2022 date in, in one of his studies, this one year. Um, and, you know, I need to actually ask him about it. Um, so, so we have this proposing of the riddle and which has been this examination or this understanding of the lines since that time. So on the 26th of December, we start this study. Um, and that's in a sense to address uh, the lines themselves. And then we're going to start um, and I can't remember the date we start that. I think it was March 7th that we start. Uh, no, that's the year before. I'm trying to remember what the date was because we did some studies on, might have been the week after a call-in study. Uh, maybe that's it, um, the Friday. Anyway, we're going to do a study on the presidents. So however we try to put that together, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to look at that in a bit more detail. But anyway, that's the point, is we're zoomed into this December 25th date, and it does have this echo with the December 25th, 2022, right? So that's where we're going to count those 2,658 days to April 5th, 2030. I don't know if I'm going off track a little bit here. But I just think the turning aside, if we're going to try to characterize that prior to July 18th, I mean, this lion does produce something, right? It does. It produces this honey that is the eating of the little book. And 
And so it has to represent that history from 11-9 or 9-11, both. Um, it has to represent that history going to July 18th. So we're saying that the honey itself is also representational of a message. Right. And so that message of July 18th that's presented is a prophetic message. Is it a prophetic testing message? Okay. So, well, every message is a testing message. I mean, people have, have caught me on this or, you know, criticized me on this, where I'll say that, you know, July 18th was not a test. And it wasn't prior to July 18th. But it is now a test after July 18th to a certain group of people. The people who went through July 18th, July 18th is now a test, whether you accept it and understand it. Correct? Correct. Affirmative. Yeah, but I didn't think that before July 18th that it was a test. And, and some people don't quite understand what I mean by that. Right, because they think, well, how can it be a test after what, but not before? And, and especially when, you know, the idea is that something's going to happen on July 18th. Um, so obviously the people who, who are going to be tested after July 18th would have been people that believed in July 18th prior or at least were part of that movement of July 18th. You know, Jeff was expounding on that very subject um, that it wasn't necessarily uh, before, but definitely after they've lived through it, they had to accept it at that point. Um, and I don't recall exactly what he was talking about, but I do recall his statement when he was making it because I just heard it just a couple of days ago while I was going over that 81. Well, and, and definitely that would be true even with October 22. <laughs> I mean, the, the actual specific date. Right, because um, people may have been doubtful about the October 22 date, but still anticipated that it was going to occur, but still weren't sure about it. I mean, I wasn't sure about July 18th, so I guess that's part of the reason I say it wasn't a test, is, I mean, I knew the date and the chronology and all that was important, but I wasn't 100% certain that, that the event would occur. And so once the event didn't occur, though, it became really clear that it was a test, that people couldn't reject July 18th uh, with any kind of safety. And, and we saw what happened once they rejected July 18th, of course, they fall off the path. So, uh, so I'm always a little bit cautious about talking about what is a test, you know, a testing prophetic message. We know that this is a three-step testing prophetic message that is a reform line. But particularly where the tests are for each individual and, and what the tests are for each individual can, can vary based upon that person's light and knowledge. But we know when, when we have a line itself, if you have the first, second, and third angel's messages, each of them are tests. Right? All right. So, yes. So I, th I think the point here, though, dealing with the lion and the honey, is that he goes aside to look at this carcass and finds this honey. And if we're going to take this lion roaring as representative of Revelation chapter 10, Millerite history, um, if we understand how we came to July 18th, like the whole process right from the very beginning, which was examining... Uh, the 2520 and Millerite history and all of that. We can see that there is this message that comes out of that lion. And that honey here in this context refers to, to this message of the proclamation of time in connection with July 18. So, you know, it's extremely important that, um, you know, we understand 
not necessarily every detail, all the intellectual details, but we understand the basic principle that's being applied here is that many people denied that that message of July 18 was of God. But if it's, if it's characterized here by honey, it has to be a message of God. It comes from an unsealing of the seven thunders, right? It's that little book that's open. And that definitely occurs in our history. And we, we have to mark 9-11 and 11-9 as this lion roaring. This is prophecy speaking to us. It's fulfillment of prophecy. But then this riddle that comes after, at the end of the 777 days, we have to remember there are two things that happen on December 25th, 2021, prophetically. Stephen discovers the 777 years from 457 to 321 AD to the year of Constantine's Sunday Law on March 7th, 321. And Colin uh, reveals this riddle. Now, what was the importance of Stephen's uh, recognition of this 777 years at the end of these 777 days? I mean, I can tell it all to you. Con confirmation. And, and why is it a confirmation is occurring on, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> December 25th, 2021? Would it have been a confirmation on any other day? I don't think so. Right, because we had 20, uh, the 20th day of the ninth month, December 25th, 2021, representing what? What did it represent on our line as a symbol? Sunday law? Yeah, it symbolized the Sunday law. So on the day of the Sunday law of the 777 days, Stephen recognizes the Sunday law connected with the 70 weeks as ending in 321, right? So that's the year of the Sunday law. So this becomes important. So there's this significance of time the past with now this riddle being given, right? And so, so Colin's presentation and Stephen's revelation have to come together there. And, and it, you know, how it how it comes about, too, is just so, I mean, you could think, well, Colin's just obviously going to present this, this study on that date. But that, that wasn't a given. I can't remember exactly the circumstances, but he wasn't really planning, I don't think, of speaking on that day. It just ended up that way. And, and then, of course, Odilio presenting seven weeks later, I mean, nobody's planning this out. So we can see the 70 weeks represented there, right, The with the seven weeks and Odilio's presentation. So, so, so now we have this, this part of this riddle is this history that we're in, but it's going to bring us to the end of Colin's prediction, December 25th, 2020, or, or uh, uh, January 11th, 2023. But it also brought us to December 25th, 2022, the first day of the 10th month. So when the divorce proceedings begin. So both of these dates represent uh, this period of time. And if we look at, in the story of Ezra, I mean, is there a riddle? Is a question I'm asking in Ezra chapter 10. Is there a riddle? Not, there isn't literally one, but is there symbolically a riddle? I hadn't considered that yet. So what, what about the divorce? Is that a riddle? The divorce proceedings. Could we look at that as a riddle? A court case, court cases. Do they have any similarity? Well, would that be a type of the investigative judgment? Okay. 
So it's a type in the investigative judgment. So there is this, you know, this three months in which this, this divorce proceedings occur. It's going to earn, end on the first day of uh, the first month, right? So, <clears throat> uh, you know, trying to, you know, trying to understand this fully. I mean, it, there is a type of riddle in a sense. I mean, uh, you know, maybe it's a legal riddle. But, you know, it's not a riddle in the sense of, of, of how we would look at a riddle. But it also does present to our minds, this whole situation presents to us a riddle, right? That is, there is something that we have to unravel regarding this story of Ezra. Yeah, you can put it like that, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So this whole thing, this whole unraveling of 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 even Ezra 7 to 10, all of this thing for me was like a puzzle that I had to put together, right? So it was this chronological puzzle. And, and we can see, of course, you know, all of these dates we have, the 30, 30, 30, the 30 times 88, all these things that bring us to April 5th are all part of this, this puzzle. So, when when Colin proposes this riddle, so to speak, you know, he's going to look at at these verses, Daniel 2, 10, and Revelation 17, and bring them all together. It's all part of a structure which which is unfolding in a sense that we're we're kind of unraveling all of this chronological detail. And so, I mean, this is a very complex or maybe the word should be involved um, riddle. That is, it, it, it brings together all of these different threads that we have studied in this movement. And so part of the problem is in, in understanding it is you need to understand each of the pieces. Like if you're putting together a puzzle and you only have a couple of pieces, you, you might, and you might be able to fit those two together, but you don't see the whole picture until you bring all of the lines together, all these pieces of the puzzle. And that's what we've been doing. And, you know, so to try to make that accessible to everyone is, is partly why I believe God gave us this information. So I believe that Colin's study and Odilio's study are important pieces of information. But if you just looked at those two, you wouldn't have enough pieces to, to put the puzzle together, right? You need April 5th. You need January 11th, 2023. You need December 25th, 2022, right? You need to understand how these things fit together. Does that help a little bit, uh, Dwight? Well, I think we're all looking at this in these situations as a, for lack of a better term, a grand mosaic. Okay. Because we're not, we, we see bits and pieces of certain portions, but we're not seeing the entire picture yet. I don't think we are, right? Which is why I think that we have to come together. So um, as a child, uh, I, I grew up putting puzzles together. Um, mm -hmm. And what we used to do would we recognize colors and stuff and we put clustering these together and then start to see that picture emerge. And then we go over to another one as we as these different pictures emerge, then we can start to join them together. This is a, <laughs> this analogy just works for me in so many levels. Okay. Right. So the, the puzzle thing is, of course, what I would do is examine all the pieces of the puzzle first. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm well, not... you have to do that. And so you can kind of group the colors together. Yeah. I mean, that's that's always been my you, 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 you look at everything at the as it's sitting on the table. You turn all the pieces over 
you know, yeah. so you can see them and view them. And then you start clustering these, these light colors together until, and then you start moving them around and, and seeing what fits. And then you start developing mm-hmm. that picture. And so yeah. uh, the, again, again, this analogy just works with me in so many levels. It's, it's, it's incredible. I think God's been kind of raising me up for this whole thing because of this. I mean, my mom got me started in that, you yeah. know, and, and I do it all the time. And, and one of the other things that I do is play solitaire. And so numbers and I get along real well. <laughs> and the more you so keep that, that sol- solitaire gathering this light out, the more that it gets exposed. Yeah. Sorry well, about that. Just- yeah. But well, both solitaire and puzzles to some degree are a waste of time. Solitaire probably more so. Um, oh, no, I, I get that. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, that's why I rather do. I, I'm just saying it's, oh, but it's training. It's, it's training. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's lots of things I've done in the past that have helped my mind develop in a certain way. But it's definitely developed much more studying the Bible. It stretches your intellect. Absolutely. Your memory, I agree with you. 100%. Much more than these other things. But yeah, lots of different experiences we've had in the past do uh, prepare us uh intellectually and experientially uh, to do these things. But uh, the point is here, you know, we have this puzzle to unravel and God needs all of us in this process. I mean, I might understand more about this than anybody. And the one thing I know is how little I know. That is, there's so much that I don't understand. And and definitely my mind is not the mind uh, to make this understandable to everyone. So if people are going to understand this, if everyone in this movement is going to understand this, we need various minds um, understanding it and presenting it in various ways. Because I could not possibly imagine that everybody would have to listen to me and understand what I'm saying. I I just don't have that ability to do that as much as I try. Right. So God needs this movement. He needs everyone in the movement, all of the parts of the body working together. If we are going to understand this fully, right? Uh, yeah, that's been my contention. Mm-hmm. And, and I've always understood this need of the body, the church. You know, as I've said before, if I never had Adventism, if I didn't have the church, I would just be off in some stray corner of of theological thought all by myself, um, you know, it wouldn't benefit anyone and, and probably least of all me, right? So, so we need the differences in others. We need to be challenged in our character, in our intellect, you know, in our, in our relationships with other people. All these things have to be challenged and they're challenged by being a part of a body something that I, I don't particularly enjoy, right? I mean, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's stressful dealing with people. But this is the way that God has designed things, because if we're going to be um, dwelling with one another in heaven, um, we're going to have to be able to dwell together on earth. He that loves his brother who he has not seen cannot love God who he has not seen. If I said that right, I think I did. He does not love his brother. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I think that ties up some of those loose ends. We'll probably still come back to them uh, again. Now we had started on Judges 15, and um, so just again to review this, I'm just going to read through this quickly. Uh, it came to pass within. A while after, in the time of wheat harvest, so we connected that to those uh, seven weeks, right, which is from Collins to Adilio study, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So I said that this refers to the Omega, the younger sister. 
Well, <clears throat> and, and do you have thoughts on that? Well, I'm I'm going to ask you a question regarding Judges fifteen one. Okay. So to break it down, so we know that it came to pass that after a while in the time of wheat harvest. Now you're placing that in within the seven weeks or 49 days between Colin and Odilio's presentations. Yeah. So first question would be, is this, you know, trying to line this up with a time of a jubilee? Um, well, I don't know what you mean. We well, don't know. We have no idea when the jubilee cycle is. So no, I mean, okay, two jubilee cycles that we have in the Bible, but I don't know how you would relate that to now. Well, but or, um, would, or would you be looking at this lining up regarding the feast of weeks, which was seven weeks, seven sabbaths of weeks? Yeah. So the way that I understand it is that when I did my study back in 2015 or whatever it was, maybe it was 2014, and I had um, taken the 70 weeks and I connected it with the two Lamics, okay. right? So the 777 structure, that is the 7 times 7 times 7 is 343, and the 434 days in the middle, Um or years, pardon me, in the middle, and I added those together to get 777. So I showed how the two Lamecs were gathered, were, were together, that they both symbolized the 70-week prophecy. Now, we have this seven weeks between Colin and Odilia. I'm not saying that this is, that we put this here. I'm saying that this is representative of the entire 777 structure. And, and that from Colin to Odilio's presentation symbolizes that because it's it's part of the 70 weeks in a sense. So, so all these things are tied together. But I'm going to have this going back to 9-11. If we're going to bring this or 11-9, right? So we're going to bring this Samson visiting his wife with the kid. We, we can look at it in two different ways. We can look at what happened at 9-11 with spiritual formation, or we could look at it at what happened at November 9th with Parminder's group. And, and that's the way that I would primarily look at it. If we're going to look at this verse, we're going we're gonna to see that Feast of Weeks in here, but we're really going to still bring it back to that where you have this younger sister that's being offered to Samson. Because if Samson is this movement, the message specifically of July 18, that's, that's what happened. This younger sister was presented to us as this option. And that would have been what Parminder was presenting. It is fairer, that is to human nature, it's more appealing. Well, all right. Does that tie in in any way with Genesis 38? Okay. Specifically Genesis 38, 17. Okay. Um, well, Cause you're dealing with this kid. Correct. Hmm. Okay, so how would you connect that thematically? I mean, you got you got the the kid of the from the flock, which is going to be given as a pledge. Um, well, and, and we really, have Timnath here as well, right? So, so we have Timnath, but now, now we have Judah and Tamar, right? And we're talking about this as a kid of the flock. Now, as a as a question dealing with syntax and dealing with the verbiage that's being used here, is this a she-goat? 
a female goat. Um, don't know. How would you know? I'm, a, I'm knowing that Hebrew expresses many things in masculine and feminine. I'm asking, is this being specific? No, it's not. It's not being specific. We don't know whether it's a kid of the sheep or the goats. We don't know whether it's a male or female. There's no way we can know that. Well, okay, so then... Look at how Hebrew does it. They, they don't really distinguish kids as male or female in that sense, right? Because they're not considered male or female until they're they're no longer kids when they can be productive right okay so well, it just has to do with how they understand gender and how they use words so there there's nothing here that could tell us other than that it's it's either a baby uh goat or baby sheep doesn't tell us which they okay. don't it them. says kid that's all it says yeah well, it, it technically says a young goat, and and then it has a she goat in 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 the Hebrew. Those are the words that are used. So, um, but it's not because um, if you look this word up, um, it says a young male goat. And then the other one says a she goat. So, uh, so that's what it says here. Um, so, if it's if it's going to be, um, let me see here. So I'm going to look up. Let me see here. So often it will be a kid from the flock. That's this one. Um, that's going to be in the same story. She goat, a kid, a young goat. So I might um, just hang on here. I can't find it anyway. Uh, let me see here. So I could be wrong here on this word that's used. So this this word, um, yeah. So they're going to use lamb for sheep, and they're going to use. So this is a goat, but it's a male goat, according to what it's saying here. Okay, <clears throat> the reason, part of the reason why I'm asking the question. I'm wrong about what I was saying here. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go okay. on. Again, I don't have the training that you do in especially with this language. So I'm I'm having to look at what was being used and presented within this with ESORD. Now, when I'm looking at this, of course, where ESORD is going to show this as being Hebrew five seven nine or five. Okay, so that's that's referring to the mother. Okay. Right. But, so, so in Hebrew, what this what this says, um, this this here this kid um, is two different words, right? Right. And it's just talking about the young goat, which comes from its mother, the she goat. Okay. So, 
Hebrew five seven niner five the first two she goat is taken from Hebrew five eight one zero. At least that's what it's showing in Esword. Yeah, five eight ten. Right. It means to be strong. Okay. Now. I know this is going far afield, but I unscrambled those numbers and I come up with 1850. As in a reference to the 1850 chart. Okay. I don't now, know if I would go that far, but I'd have to have a reason to do that. Well, okay. Here is, here is Samson. Samson wants to go into his wife. He takes with him a kid of the goats. Yeah. Now, Judah and his situation was that he gave a pledge of a kid of the goats in order to enter into an illicit covenantal relationship with one that he did not know was his daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. Here's Samson who has entered into an illicit covenantal relationship and he's taking with him a kid of the goats. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke 15, 29, in the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal makes the comment that you had not even allowed me a kid of the goats so that I could have a feast with my friends. So why is Samson taking a kid with him? to see his wife what what ironically can we see is the purpose of this i don't know if you'd see it ironically because it's not immoral no oh. right so you can't you can't it's only the moral aspects that are ironic okay Prophetic aspects. but his his situation here as a nazarite he was not to enter into that type of relationship with a philistine and he has done so right yeah, so I mean, we know that we're applying this to the church. Okay. So does Genesis 38, specifically 38 17, help us to understand this any more clearly as to why he's taking this kid of the goats with him to see his wife? I don't know. Do you have any proposal on how it helps us? I don't see anything that helps us. I'm still puzzling it out between this verse and Luke 15, 29. Why would you connect Luke 15, 29? As the parable reads. But a kid of the goats is a common thing, right? But there's, I don't see anything that connects us to this story. I can see that with, with Genesis um, 38. I mean... To put it in the lowest common denominator, Judah is paying for services render with, rendered with the kid of the goats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that story makes sense. In, in here, I'm just not sure what, what, uh, what it tells us. But it, connecting that, I understand. We can connect it. Because we got Timnath. We got the kid of the goats. We have a relationship. 
that's illicit. Right. But we don't have that in the story of uh, the prodigal son. But it's Christ himself that's giving reference to this about the prodigal complaining because he's not even been given a kid that I may make merry with my friends. Right. But I wouldn't, but that is, I mean, I don't know how you could connect the two. You're going to have to enlighten me on how they're connected. I mean, we can't take every time that a kid is offered and just connect it to the story of Judges 15. Because that's a really common occurrence, right? Well, again, in applying Miller's rules, when we have a problem with something, we, we try to bring all of the verses that have any kind of relationship with this together. Well, I agree. So that's what I see you're doing. But not every verse is going to have a relationship just because it has a similar word. You have to consider the context, unless you could tell me, you know, because there might be something that I'm missing. Um, I mean, this is the elder son who says this, so it's. But. Um, <clears throat> elder son and in in this with Samson, he's being offered the younger sister. Yeah. So. In other words, Samson has made a choice. His now father-in-law, the Philistine father-in-law, is saying, I thought you hated her. And as, as it was noted in the chapter before, the father-in-law gave his daughter, who had now been married to Samson, he gave it to one of uh, one of those that was supposed to be his friend. So he gave it to another Philistine, not to another of the children of Israel. Which chapter is this in Luke? I'm trying to find it. I'm not doing very good. 1529. Okay, 1529. I don't, I don't see any connection between this story and Judges 15, but I, right. I just don't see what in that story we, what it would help us. It, it... All I'm looking at from that from Luke is this was being given reference that having a kid was a reason of celebration. Yeah. And okay. here he's contrasting it with the fatted calf. So he said, basically, you didn't even ever give me a kid, you know, that I could celebrate with my friends. So, I mean, there's nothing negative there um, where we can see that uh, Genesis 38, we have the Timnath connection. And I just don't see what it would show us. It wouldn't, it, I don't see anything there. It, it's Isn't like, isn't the pieces of the puzzle might be the same color, but they don't fit together. Isn't a a marriage or a wedding a reason for a celebration? Mm -hmm. Now they had a marriage feast at which the riddle is proposed, and then the riddle is revealed. Mm -hmm. So. Samson is now, after a while, coming to his wife. He wants to celebrate their wedding. He brings a kid to show that he is able to celebrate this with her so that it can be theirs, their celebration, kind of a private celebration. And his father-in-law says... I thought you utterly hated her. And that the statement in the English doesn't make a lot of sense, but yet 
when we're looking at that on the utterly hated, do we not have a doubling? Yeah, because that's the Hebrew way of, and it's 813 too, by the way. Um, but, but it's the way of of doing an emphatic, right? Okay, but as, as we've said before, okay, the, the 813 is a, a great way of looking at this, but it's also when we're seeing this doubling, the second angel's message. Right, right. But but as I'm saying, in Hebrew, you're going to double anytime you have this emphatic. Okay. Sort of, um, what, I can't remember the word they use. Uh, but anyway, when you're going to like, um, you know, like very or extremely or whatever, you're going to double the word. So you're always going to have that in Hebrew. That's like, just like in dying, ye shall die. You shall surely die. It's in dying, ye shall die. Right? Um, All right. Or captivity captive, same same idea. So it's just the way that they they do this. Um, so when the father in law makes the decision to give Samson's wife to the one that he had used as his friend, we see this in Judges fourteen twenty. So is this giving us a further reference in a manner to something occurring in 2014? Okay, you need to you need to expand on this. My mind's not following you. So we've already accepted that judges is giving us chapter by chapter an outline of that which we are looking at year by year since 2001 right yeah and judges 13 and judges 14 both cover the 777 days right right but the initial portion that we or the initial point that we were making was that as we look at this Chapter 14 would have given us a symbol for us to consider what was going on during 2014. Or did I did I fully misunderstand that? Um, well, I don't I'm not sure what you're referring to. What was the symbol? That Judges 14 was giving us a symbol of what had, had occurred within the movement in 2014. Okay, and where, where was that? I thought that was what we had, we had addressed early on when we were in this in the study of Judges. Well, because it refers back to Parminder. Right. Right. But Judges 14 is focused mostly upon July 18th and, and the end of it, right? I mean, basically the end of the 777, so December 25th. But the seeds of what became the symbols that we saw with July 18th were being planted and scattered by 2014 with what Parminder was trying to do within the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, my question had to do with with Judges 1420. Right. Is this not reaffirming what we had initially thought? Okay, but what are you telling me that it's saying? Like that's what I don't understand. You haven't so who's Samson's wife? Who's the companion that he had used as his friend? Are we given anything that tells us that? Well, I don't know. Are you saying that this companion would be Parminder's message? But, but you know, Samson's wife, I mean, we already understood that uh, Samson's wife is a false system of study, right? Which comes from Parminder. Right. 
not originally, but, you know, through him to this movement. So as, as we would have looked at this in a more plain way, mm -hmm. Parminder to the movement would have been one more like Judas among the disciples. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's how we understood it here. So. so in this situation, if Parminder is Judas, there was a time where Parminder was standing as a good friend, a close friend to the movement and to Elder Jeff. Mm -hmm. Yet he had his agenda and was hiding his agenda from direct public scrutiny. He was keeping it secret. Mm -hmm. So the agenda of Samson's companion, whom he had used as a friend, could then be tied directly with Parminder. But it would also point right back to 2014 when he was becoming more relevant to many within the movement. Yeah, well, more around 2015, I think. But um, because in 2014, he's not really, I mean, he's relevant, I guess. He's been relevant to people in in the UK. Um, and I'm not sure where else. Um, but... You know, I don't meet Parminder until 2015. Right. And then he's going to be ordained in 2016. Along with Tavo and uh, the other guy. So, so we know that what's happening here in the, because this is going to go back to November 9th, right? Okay. This is the transition, both chapter 13 and chapter 14 and chapter 15 all go back to November 9th, right? So this wife that Samson was interested in, that, that he was, you know, seeking to marry, does have to do with Parminder's message, though um, I don't remember doing 2014 per se, other than that this goes back to Parminder's prediction of the Sunday law in 2014. Um, but this ends up being about more November 9th. So, and, and when you get to the end of chapter 14, um, and it goes back then into verse 20, I mean, it's really going back to the beginning of this line, right? So on our chart, um, where we have that, you know, where we have marked out uh, Judges 14. We have Judges 14, 14 at December 25th, 2021. That's where we placed it. But that's the Sunday law. The only way that I connected that to 2014 is that's when Parminder predicted the Sunday law. Right? So in 2012, Parminder said there was going to be a Sunday law in 2014. So when we get to the Sunday law symbol at the end of our line, um, that connects us to 2014 because this is now the symbol for the Sunday law in our line. All right. Right. So that's the only way that I could see that it was connected. Ju Judges 14, just like Judges 13 and Judges 15, are going to start at 11.9, but also 9.11. Right. So they because they, we tie those two together as symbols. So am I understanding you correctly, then? Is that making sense? Well, 
I'm trying to present this out there so that we can have this conversation and discussion and have others join in. Mm -hmm. Because some of this, especially when when I was looking at this with Judges 15-1, there just there just seemed to be some strange tie-ins with Genesis 38. Well, yeah, and I agree with the Genesis 38 ones. I know. Um, yeah, because that that's pretty clear. You have Timnath, you have an illicit relationship, um, you have the kid of the goats uh, introduced here in 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 a sense for payment, right? Right. So, so we have all all the symbols there. Um, now, what what is the whole gist of the story in Genesis thirty eight? Like, what what's the whole issue? With you know, with no pun. Well, your issue in Genesis thirty eight was the fact that Judah had not given his youngest son to Tamar to become her husband after the death of the first two brothers. Right. And then? Well, without, without a husband, then how was Christ to become the lion of the tribe of Judah? Because at that point, the youngest son was not married. And Christ's lineage came through this illicit relationship. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's the lion of the tribe of Judah from a a relationship that was not completely in keeping with God's order. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know that, I mean, if we read this whole st story, because I've looked at it before, right. We know that um, an own in, 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 Okay, so in verse 8 of Genesis 38, and Judah said unto Onan, go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when, it went, when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he slew him also. Then said Judah to Tamar, the daughter-in-law, remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house, right? And so then she's going to do this whole thing so that she can get seed, um, right, by deceiving Judah. Right. So if we're going to look at how this relates to Samson, um, now we know Samson's a type of Christ. Correct. And he's from which tribe? Dan. So he's from the time of tribe of Dan, right? So if we're going to say, though, that Samson typifies Christ, can we not connect this story to uh, Genesis 38 to show the parallel there? We should be able to because at this point, Samson as a type of Christ is the type of Christ, not as a priest, not as a king, but as a judge. Right. Yeah. But we can take this story and parallel them and show that that Samson is a type of Christ. Yes. From from Genesis 38. OK, so I think that that helps us a little bit in establishing that that Samson's a type of Christ even though he's from the tribe of Dan. He becomes the accuser of the brethren here in this context, which would be satanic, right? The opposite of Christ. But the story is ironic. And so it still typifies Christ. So Judah had made a promise 
it was a promise that Tamar figured out that he had no desire to fulfill. Yeah. So what he's doing is in a manner of speaking, he is sending Tamar away almost as if he was divorcing her. Yeah. So he is choosing not to value her to say that she should have any kind of support as she would get older. Right. So that's, I mean, that, that's the ultimate in disrespect that could be paid to her. Mm -hmm. She had not done something that was worthy of this disrespect because Judah's two sons had made the decision that they didn't want to have fathered children for their brother. Well, the, the second one for their brother, the first yeah. one did it. And it was his action that led to his demise. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay. So so when uh, Sheila's grown, because um, that's what she sees in verse 14, um, but he was not, uh, she was not given unto him to wife, right? Right. Sees this. So she's going to go through this disguise. I mean, the covering of the face, how would we apply this symbolically? Well, I mean, one of the ways that the covering of the face happened, um, which we see later in Exodus, is Moses' face being covered. But right, it's, it's, because he his face shone so greatly. Yeah. But here we I, have a woman covering her face. Correct. So we have the woman covering her face. She is portending to be what she was not. Here's a woman that is twice widowed. She is widowed because of decisions of her husband's. Mm -hmm. She seeks to be supported as she gets older, and it's only by children that that would occur. Mm -hmm. She's been given a, given a word. The word has not been fulfilled. She sees this as occurring, so she decides to obtain by deception what was her right now payment for services the meal for that day was a kid But she does not receive the kid. She holds on to the pledge. And how many items were given her as a pledge? See, wasn't it her bracelets and um, yeah. a stick or something? She was given three yeah. items. Yeah, signet, yeah, wasn't it? bracelet, and staff. Or the bracelet and staff. Now, signet 
is normally something that we would find used by a king to seal an official document. Yeah. A staff, yes. a staff is something that is used by a shepherd in order to direct his sheep. Yeah, it could also just be a walking staff. Could also be a walking stick is right. Something that supports you along a rough road. Yeah. Well, what's the purpose of the bracelets? Well, it's the word is twine, bound, bracelet, lace, line, ribbon, thread, wire. So um some sort of an identifier. Well, I mean, this is more like the what they would put around their wrists for, you know, the remembering the law. That's what I think of here, but. So in that situation, bond. go ahead. It could be a bond. Well, the verse I'm thinking of here is, um, yeah, I understand what you're asking. Is it a bond? But if, if we look at it where this here, uh, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make upon them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe the borders a ribbon of blue. So, so what I'm thinking of is that ribbon there referring to that blue thread. And so what would that mean in the context of his signet, his ribbon of blue, let's say, and his staff? If this is going to be those, I mean, obviously this is later on, right? So this is way earlier. They don't have these ribbons of blue in Genesis, but could it symbolize that just as a symbol? As a symbol, yeah, why not? Okay, so if we're gonna take these three, the signet, this symbol of the law that's in your hand to remind you, and the staff, could they symbolize these three things, symbolize something together? would be related. Christ. Well, as, as I was led to present, the signet would be the symbol of something that a king would use. Mm -hmm. If the bracelets are a symbol of the law, mm -hmm. that makes sense. And then the staff being a symbol of the shepherd, because as we often say, Christ is the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. So does this not symbolize three aspects of Christ's character? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we also have Moses' staff. Correct. And he was a sheep herder, wasn't he? Definitely. So Thank there's a connection you. there. And she conceived by him. That's kind of like Mary. I mean, we can say this typifies the three angels' message. We can have this ad address um, in type what Christ is going to do, right? 
I mean, it's not just that Christ is conceived, but he's also conceived in us, right? So this is about a three-step testing prophetic message. And all these things are pointing to Christ, right? These are This is the line of Christ that's going to be represented here through these pledges. So, I mean, I think this is a little far afield from where we are where we are in Judges fourteen, though I think it's it's definitely related. But this is more about the prophecies pointing to Christ, which, which of course point to the end as well, right? Because if we're going to tie this, let's say, to the fulfillment of the prophecy of the promised seed, right? If you go back to Genesis chapter three and you look at this this thread of the seed of the woman that that the Old Testament is, is giving you, right? It's giving you this line. And then that's going to be fulfilled with the birth of Christ. I mean, that would be the primary way I would understand Genesis 38, that it's more about Christ. It does give us evidence, though, because of the symbols in Judges 14 or Judges 15, the symbols in Judges 15 that show that Samson is a type of Christ. But I, I don't know that we could do beyond that because this is a different, I mean, it's a different story and it, it illustrates, all these stories illustrate the same thing. But we're trying to put Judges 15 on a line and I don't know if this helps us put it on the line at all. But, but it does help us establish some things about Samson. And, and the one thing that we could say from this is this seed of the woman, this line of Christ, the prophecy about Christ coming, the 70 weeks, which is really going to be the prophecy that nails down the time of, of the Messiah, of the anointed, when he's going to be baptized, when he's going to die on the cross, when he's going to begin his work in the heavenly sanctuary. All these things do relate to our line, right? Because our line is a repeat of history, and it, it carries those symbols. But I, I don't know if we need to look further into Judges or Genesis 38, if that's going to. Well, <clears throat> it's. The tie-in with the symbol about this with the kid uh -huh. that I found to be most intriguing because in the lowest uh -huh. in the, at the lowest point, Judah is paying for services rendered. Uh -huh. And then you've got Samson. But is he taking this kid to his wife to make merry with her, or is he saying something else? Well, well, I think it says, I will go in into my wife into the chamber. So, I mean, the idea is that he's bringing this, I wouldn't know if it's an offering per se, but um, he's definitely figure that, figuring that he's finishing the marriage uh aspect of it consummating the marriage and finishing this all up what had begun earlier right but he can't do that now right because the father had given um his wife to the one that had used to be his companion right and then he offers her this younger sister which i still say has to be the message of parminder the omega So this has to be 11.9. Right. Right, because that's that's when that exchange happens in connection with the 11.9. The date that Parminder and Tess proposed is where the separation in this movement comes. Now, it continues to some degree, but um, because other people are going to take that younger sister, obviously. 
obviously FFA does with their declaration. Mm. I mean, so it's good to look at all those things. I don't think it's got us any farther. It doesn't, it doesn't um, change how we look at this. Does it provide yeah, what it seems to be is more fuel for other expeditions? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Does it offer any other clarity for what we have been addressing? Yeah, it, it adds, adds clarity to it. Now, isn't that what we're supposed to do if we're studying this according to Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just want to get through this faster. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry bit, about that. I'm a little bit impatient with, with how slow we're going. Because mm -hmm. we always study this and we should just be able to put this on the line, which is what I'm trying to do right now. Don't, you know, we're supposed to look at what, this, this is the way I understand it. We're looking at what we studied. We understand it already because we've gone through it. I mean, we're going to notice details that we didn't notice before, which we agreed upon. But it doesn't change where we place any of this or how we interpret any of this. It does, it does add confirmation. And, and, and the main thing that it adds for me has to do with that Samson is a type of Christ, but also the purpose of these lines, right? Because this is, so if we think about these 777 seven, seven days, which we may not have thought about this, we get those 777 initially from the 70 weeks and the connection of the two Lamechs before we ever get to the 777 days in counting it any other way. So, so we have this symbol from the two Lamechs. And we know that Lamech, if you take the gematria and you multiply each of the letters, you get 18720, right? So Lamech becomes connected with the message of July 18, 2020, through just the name itself. But we were studying Lamech, you know, three years or four years before we had any time setting, you know, like November 9th or July 18th. So... <clears throat> And that understanding to me is is extremely important that we we connected these the story of Lamech and we found so many other things about Lamech the sixty five years the one hundred and eighty seven years making the two fifty two years right from uh, um, what's his name can't take his name because you have Enoch and you have Methuselah and um, and Lamech right. So, right. yeah. yeah, so so the, these things were there, but we had Lamech like four years before, right? You know, maybe five years before we actually even figured out, because it was in 2019 that we even figured out Lamech was 18720, multiplying the gematria. Um, so... So God has given us this inheritance of this chronology. He's prepared and laid the groundwork, but it's from the 70 weeks. And the 70 weeks are connected to the 2520. Right? Because the understanding that I got from the 70 weeks came from studying the 2520. If it wasn't for the 2520, I wouldn't have noticed any of those things in uh, the 70 weeks, the structure of them. And, and this is about the 777 days. So what we can say about our line is it's a condensation or a fractal of all these things that have gone before, but especially in connection with the character of Christ being born in us, us getting Christ's character, the everlasting gospel, right? Because the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message. Right. And we can see this in our line personally. So it helps us understand that this is connected to the seed of Christ. 
So when people try to say that chronology is, you know, is not needed, it's a bunch of confusing numbers. And do I really need to understand this? Shouldn't I just be studying the third message? Then they're missing out on the whole purpose of prophecy. One is it shows us who Christ is, but it also is a process that we go through to develop the character of Christ. That we, we can't develop the character of Christ without participating in prophecy. You know, sitting in your cave like a monk, contemplating how lovely Christ is, isn't going to produce the character of Christ. I know the three wise men recognized Christ because they were students of prophecy. Right. Yeah. But, and, and this has been the problem with Adventism. Is it starts with 1919. Uh, the doctrine of Christ. Nothing wrong with any of the things that uh, that um, Prescott says in that book. If you read the book, it's fine. The problem is he wants to divorce it from prophecy. You know, especially time prophecy. And Adventists aren't interested in time. Right? They're not interested in watching and waiting and measuring time. They just... Hope one day they wake up and they see that there's a Sunday law in the papers and then they, they know where they're going to stand. That's what they imagine. They want the instant change. Right. But it won't happen. We have to go through this experience. So, I mean, that is definitely illustrated in Gen uh, Deuter Deuter Genesis 38. And... And we can see it demonstrated all the way through the story of Judges as we apply this to our line. That's what our movement is about. Okay, so we didn't. We got less farther today than we did yesterday. Um, but at least it's clarified. So, you know, you just have to forgive me being annoyed. Forgive my impatience. Because I've been no. a bit impatient with it. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, uh, Theodore, I mean, it's just your mannerisms and stuff that make me go, well, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed that I haven't been studying as hard as you on this stuff because it's, it's you've already figured a lot of this stuff out. It's all because of the handling. And I got to confess that I don't, I didn't handle this stuff. Yeah, and I know, um, and I know we have to go through it. We have to go through it slowly, right? So that's always my problem is that I... I want to just give all of the information that I can and get through it quickly. But going through it like this does help people. So yes. So hopefully you guys forgive me for being impatient. Um, okay. But anyway. <laughs> what's that? Yeah. He, I he forgive you for now. For now. Okay, for now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> Conditional forgiveness. Okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we're going to close with prayer. And um, we'll come back to this then again Sunday morning. Now, you know, for people watching the videos here, one is I can't upload my videos until my uh, strike is removed from YouTube. But Iran is uploading them, as, as people know. So if you did see this on Facebook, because now, Iran, are you just putting them on the future uh, uh, or the FFA study group site? Is that the only it's on also the July 18 and the WhatsApp chat. Okay. So there's a couple other. I have five sites that I usually place it on. So I'll put it on the other sites. Um, so, so from study uh, 252 to study 256, those ones I won't be able to place because um, I don't think I'll be able to post videos till Monday. So the Sunday morning one as well, I won't be able to post until Monday. Uh, so, and I probably won't get them all up on that Monday. But uh, anyway, so those those studies here of this, they will eventually be up on my YouTube page, just late. <clears throat> and, um, and then, of course, we have a Friday night study. So that's not going to be posted by me until Monday. And... Um, and then Stephen's doing a presentation, which he says we can record. So, um, so we can do that and post that uh, 
Um, I, I will eventually post it on my site probably as well. And uh, and then we got this the the Sunday afternoon study. Um, and of course, Dwight study Sabbath morning. So that will again be delayed. And it was uh, Dwight study in number 87 or 57, pardon me, that ended up getting me uh, a strike. Um, so whatever reason, I got a, a, a strike there and they, they rejected my appeal. So anyway, we have all these things that um, uh, are going to be take a while to get up to my YouTube page. But thankfully, uh, we can see those at uh, the Horizontal Tree YouTube page. Um, so anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. And uh, thank you for the light that you want to shine upon our path. Help us to not be impatient um, with these things, to take our time and to see that uh, you have things to show us that are valuable and that you speak through each person. I pray that you can bless each one as we study this on our own and that we can come together to share our insights that you have revealed to us. Uh, we pray for this weekend, for the various studies, and um, we ask, Lord, that you can use us to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.